am here, ladies and gentlemen, in our DIY classroom, which was otherwise known as our classroom engagement is now DIY psychology, and we are on day two or three, I don't know, three. No, I don't know. I think we had, we, no, we started with classroom engagement on Tuesday. So day two of our DIY, no, calling this DIY psychology. It doesn't matter because we're still on the same day of whatever it was for our classroom engagement, day 15. All right. So we started our new classroom, classroom engagement, along with engaged, along with healthy mind, body, spirit classroom, which is now engaged in a healthy mind, body, spirit. I know I got so confusing. I'm almost has a headache. I had lunch. And I was working on things that I wanted you to see after I ate lunch. And then I had to brush my teeth because it was, you know, broccoli soup. And that's awful if you have a piece of broccoli stuck in your teeth. So my breath is fresh other than that sip of coffee I just took. Yay! Did you see that CSI commercial where that, oh my gosh. I don't know who can stand that guy, whatever, his acting, right? Doesn't even matter. That guy, whoa. I'm like, stop doing that. I can smell your breath from here. Oh my gosh. All right, let's get going. So today for our classroom engagement, we're going to be right back. I wanted to get our title in there. There's a reason why I am here in this room, and that's because this room allows me to do a lot more research. Oh, I don't want that title there. Um, because I have another computer right here. So, and you're gonna see that I have got the screen covered, and I keep that covered because my husband told me that they could pick up right from the screen, from any screen you have in the house. And it makes sense, but it sounds hopeless, right? So I, when he told me that, I was like, all right, you need to stop telling me these things because there's nothing I can do about that. And then you're gonna make me feel hopeless and then I can't do my job. So, but I do keep my screens covered besides my, besides my camera, right? So I also keep my screens covered as well. But, you know, I'm weird that way because, you know, oh, oh, my TV's not covered. I was just going to sw swirl that around and show you my TV is covered, but my TV's not covered right now. But there is the blanket to cover my TV and it should be covered and it should be covered. But I watch it after I do this. Okay, let's see if I can't get this right. How about that? See what happens then? Then it gets right on the other side. Okay, so what am I doing? Well, let me show you what I'm doing. We're doing a little research. Pardon me, the power of the pardon. Now, I forgot something, so I'm going to be right back. Okay, it's the, recon it's the reconstruction book that I forgot over there. So just give me a sec again. Oh, my allergies have really been kicking in. I probably have to dust for sure. Oh, probably? No, I have to dust. Although I did some dusting, but um, I got to get some deep cleaning done. Deep fall cleaning done. Last year we got the windows done. That wasn't very successful. Probably won't have that happen again. So in this reconstruction book that we are reading in our bookless classroom, um, we 
have at the end of every chapter, and maybe even then some, all kinds of suggestions, which they call inquire and investigate. So, and it's a series. So that's the series is inquire and investigate. So that's what they do throughout this entire book is tell, it tells you the story throughout. Okay. But then it gives you all kinds of suggestions for inquiring and investigating. And in fact, this is also inquiring and investigating. So this is one of the things that we talked about, which was, um, this was a monument in, I gotta say it that way, because I, I see how I have to stop, because I can't pronounce it unless I say, Hidalgo, Hidalgo, Texas, has a 2,000 pound African, Africana is what they call it, killer bee located there in Texas. So some research on the money spent on that, the upkeep of it, who, when was it dedicated, who dedicated it, who was the artist, right? All kinds of things to investigate. And so that really is what I am doing in this classroom engagement for today. So it is called uh, pardon me, the power of the pardon. So why? Because I'm looking at these cartoons here for a second because that's another thing that they suggested and I think that's the one that we're going to actually take a look at. It's just crazy the way that um, they were able to portray black people. And it was also even crazier that in these times, these the media ran these not for vilification of black people, but to demonstrate Look at what they're doing. Look at how these anti-freedmen are portraying black people. It is just uh, incomprehensible. I was looking for the one that we had, which is right here. Oh, this is one of them. Not the one I was thinking of, but here's the one in the, here's one of them right in the book. From right in the book. So these aren't so hard to find. So let me show you. I thought I had it right there on the page. Here it is, right here. So this is, in this political cartoon, illustrator Thomas Nash shows how things didn't really change for black people after the Emancipation Proclamation. And... So you've got all these white people that are standing before, who was that? Oh, this isn't exactly the same one. It's close, but it's not exactly the same one. This is Uh, pardon, Franchise Columbia, shall I trust, shall I trust these men and not this men? This is, well, let's see.
Yeah, and this was Columbia, right? Who was... I went and looked all that up. So Columbia University and where they got Columbia name from. But this has to do with a justice. So, oh, this is also a Thomas Nast. I was wondering if it was. Oh, it says Nast here where it says Nash in my book. So there could be two different people. I have a feeling it's not two different people, though. Okay. So that is what I'm doing. That's exactly what I'm doing. But let me show you. You're like, what? What are you doing? Showing us pictures with no kind of association between them? No. What I'm doing is, is I'm doing research. And because I couldn't make all the research clean, and not that I, I mean, I wanted to in a certain way, right, to be able to have, to have the answers I was looking for in the research on pardons. And so here, the book, I have to get a Kleenex. Hold on just a minute. I have to get a Kleenex. My allergies are bothering me. I've been sleeping. So the gist of this whole thing is this. There are so many wonderful in every chapter, and we're only on chapter four of this book, although it's not a very thick book, but we're about halfway through the book, okay? And there are just a plethora, there's a whole bunch, in other words, of these opportunities to better understand what is going on. And one of them that I thought that I would come here and do our, because we are, because I do a lot of research. So how do I keep myself engaged? By doing a lot of research. So in my class, in my, well, it was classroom engagement, do, DIY psychologist, one of, that's going to be something we're going to do a lot of is research. So I'm going to get online and we're going to do research together. I'm going to tell you what inspired the research and then you can either do deeper dives than I do or in in whatever area you want and I wish that you would share them with me by commenting down below. And um share some of the stats that you get you have with me. I'm a scientist and as a scientist this is what I do. So there were two things that came up that I found to be very interesting. And one was, pardon me, the power of the pardon. So here at, at the end of chapter two, so I was going back and doing some of these in the earlier chapters. I was doing some of the exercises. I was doing vocab lab is where I started. And, and again, throughout, I did a little bit of research that I just didn't share with you. I shared it with you in the booklets classroom, but it didn't amount to a lot. Again, I did some of this. Here was a suggestion on the monuments, which I still think is just absolutely fabulous. And we did in the booklets classroom do a lot of research on monuments um, as part of the lesson, but then as a result of this book on inquire and investigate a reconstruction, right? So we so we spent a lot of time in the bookless classroom talking about monuments, not specifically the Africana Killer Bee one, but we do reference that several times as one of these um, research opportunities that we took from this book on reconstruction from Judy Dodge Cummings. Okay, so, and then, then here, you're answering a bunch of questions here, right? And then there's the vocab lab that we did in class. So a bunch of questions on the monument, exercise, and then vocab lab. So for me, after chapter two was...
pardon me, pardon me. And it was, how did I, how did I get that? Because it was a better title there. The power of the pardon. Pardon, pardon me, the power of the pardon. And so, here it suggests, develop a list of questions about how and when presidents use their power to pardon. Okay, so that basically answers all my questions. How do they get to, the, to be able to do that? When do they exercise it? And then just the list of people who are pardoned is really what I care about. But it made a suggestion here, using books and reliable internet sources, researching answers to your questions about three of the following recent presidents. So I did that. I thought that was a really good idea. Limit it to recent presidents because, because you're comparing apples to apples. Republican Party back in the day is not the same as the Republican Party today. Republican Party today is known for their white supremacist attitudes. Republican Party back in the day of Reconstruction, they were known for their abolitionist attitudes. Okay, so very different. Ronald Reagan, I looked at, Barack Obama, and Donald Trump. So I looked at those three records. So following the instructions here that I liked in our book by Judy Dodge Cummings, I liked her suggestion to pick three of those. And then it says, write a letter to one of these presidents. Yeah, no, not doing that. I already wrote a letter to Barack Obama, though, and it was about... Uh, these trying times and about China taking over. As, uh, he didn't answer me, but that doesn't mean I don't think I got his attention. I wonder, you know, part of that is, I wonder if this all this stuff is going on. Because Obama's like, oh no, she knows our secrets. That was actually almost an impression of Barack Obama. <laughs> being less than, you know, being more more neurotic, but... The wife across the way is doing all the work on the um, the fall cleanup. And she's using a really small lawnmower and it's mulching and it's doing a really good job. But I'm just seeing it over there that the fact of the matter is, is those leaves are not. She did it last night. She didn't get a whole bunch of cover up, a complete redo of all the leaves the very next night like I did. So it's clear to me that somebody put that on there. 8.30 at nighttime, I had perfectly pristine lawn. The next morning, it was covered in leaves. The more I say it, the more upset I get. So these are the kinds of investigations that we have to do all the time. I mean, home buyer beware is the truth because uh, there are just clearly so many criminals who have had political power since Donald Trump has been in office because he highlights criminal behavior and criminal activity as being smart. That's smart. Downplay the universities, downplay education. Don't give any money to education and don't respect any teachers, especially get rid of all those adjuncts, right? So, but what is smart are criminals, according to Donald J. Trump. He said it himself. You all, you all know. I'm going to tell you something that you don't know. So, but there were a couple other things that I found interesting along the way as well. So here, this is patterns in power. Use the internet to research the number of vetoes and veto overrides for presidents from 1920 to 2020, and then graph the data and analyze the data and see what patterns that you see. Okay, so what I decided to do, it took me a long time to decide what to do and then also to build an in some some something of interest for you. And I couldn't find anything startling, startlingly interesting. But it doesn't mean it's not interesting. So let's take a look at what I did find. Let's start with some definitions. So what was the very first thing that I did? The very first thing I did was I did take a look on the internet for stats. I know that Wikipedia is um, uh, has references and they have to name their contributors. So since this is the case, the internet and certain sources on the internet are good places to go. 
presidential pardon, which is what I started with, right? The presidential pardon is an executive order, and this is directly from Wikipedia, is an executive order granting clemency for a conviction. It may be granted, see, it, you can see that it's exactly from it because it's got the footnote in there, and I don't have the footnote, so we, we need to get that footnote out of there. I'm going to start reading in just a second. There we go. Okay. It may be granted at any time after the commission of the crime. As per Justice Department regulations, convicted persons may only apply five or more years after their sentence has been completed. However, the president's power to pardon is not restricted by any temporal, that's time constraints, except that the crime must have been committed. Okay, so... So some of the things that I learned here was I learned that, I need to proofread, uh -huh. I learned that the president can make these presidential powers anytime. And I didn't know that before because, but I figured that out because, first of all, I read the definition, but I did that later. I figured it out because President Joe Biden had par pardons. And he is not out of office. So I, so at the end of the term, what seems to happen is this rush of pardons. All right? But they can make them any time during their presidency. I find that really, wow. Right? What is the purpose of that? But they do explain the purpose of that. So let's take a look at that, actually. So, hold on. At the very top here, oops, I'm not showing it. I thought I, I thought that it would show that right away, but it doesn't. Hold on. Okay, so here are the here's here's what they're talking about at, from federal pardons from the Wikipedia website. All right, let me get this all the way down there. There we go. Oh, let me get the name. All right, so the President of the United States is authorized by the U.S. Constitution to grant a pardon for a federal crime. So it cannot be a misdemeanor or something else. Um, the other forms of the clemency power of the president are co uh, commutation, so they can commute a sentence, remission of fine or restitution, and reprieve. A person may decide not to accept a pardon, which in which in which, in which case it does not take effect, according to the Supreme Court majority opinion. That's not what I want to say. Look at. It's interesting because from what I understand, I must have looked something else up. So let's see. I don't think I'm going to be able to find it though. Whoops. What uh, 
Well, here we go. And this is what this class is going to be about. Whenever we do research, you're going to watch me do the research. And part of it is, are you going to read along with me or not? And it doesn't matter to me, but I may or may not be talking about what I'm reading. I may just be reading. One of the things about doing all this research in advance is that you've, you've got to put it together and organize it in a perfect way to present it. Otherwise, it's not going to be comprehensible, right? Fully comprehensible. Well, that's what's going on here. It's not going to be fully comprehensible. But um, you're going to watch me. You're going to watch me gather information as the different ideas come up in my mind. Now, also, the problem is with doing it this way is that I have to go back. I mean, I like doing it this way, but it's I have to go back and remember where did I see that information from, right? So you're, you're watching me do that because I, I did get some of it done. And I'm like, you know what? I can't get all of this done. So I have to come here and show you the process. And you could do deeper dives in these other things. And you're gonna, I'm going to show you as we go along. You're like, you keep saying that. But I couldn't find the part of this. And that's what I started looking for. So that's what I'm saying. You're going to see me actually do the searches. And that is that the expectation is, is that there has been some kind of a rehabilitation with this individual. Although there are clearly no provisions for the president other than it has to have been, a federal crime has had to have been committed. That's it. They can give they can give this kind of restitution or whatever not restitution but reprieve to anybody uh, as long as it was so it's like uh, so we did see a pardon or a reprieve and uh, the uh, sentences can also be commuted pardons granted by the president's. Uh, from George Washington until Grover Cleveland's first term were handwritten by the president. Thereafter, pardons were prepared for the president by administrative staff requiring only that the president sign it. The records of these presidential acts were openly available for public inspection until 1934. In 1981, the Office of the Pardon Attorney was created and records from President George H.W. Bush forward are now listed. So the number of pardons we can see there. All right, let's not watch me. You don't have to watch me read, right? Especially when my face is like this. So there we can see, right? And the interesting part is, of course, well, part of it is a number, right? Why Andrew Jackson, 386, Oh, you mean people who committed crimes against our country? Zero for William Henry Harrison, but he was only there 30 days, right? John Tyler, James Polk. I, of course, want it. So 654 for Polk, but excludes all the pardons that he gave for ex-Confederates. So, and that I did see a list of, but I can't tell you where I saw a list of it right at this moment. But, and then right there after that, Ulysses S. Grant with 1,332. 2,480 for Woodrow Wilson. FDR, 3,687. Who was he forgiving for what? Truman, 2,044. Eisenhower, 1,157. Johnson, 1,187. Nixon, before he was out of there, 926. Wow. Gerald Ford, 409, with the most famous being Richard Nixon. Bill Clinton, 459, George W. Bush, 200, Barack Obama. So this was interesting to me. Barack Obama, 1927, Donald Trump, 237. Now, remember, Barack Obama had two terms, eight years. And we were looking at Ronald Reagan, Barack Obama, and Donald Trump and comparing those. Joe Biden has nine, but excludes the 6,500 that were pardoned for simple possession of marijuana. So that's interesting how that's going to go down in the, um, the books. 
So who knows here, because they didn't keep the list is what they said. So 16 people. There's John Adams for some of the most famous, right? Andrew Jackson. Andrew Joss Johnson. Here, these are ex-Confederates. So here are ex-Confederates that are not listed among the rest of them, right? So there are a list of ex-Confederates. Including, look at that, Samuel Arnold and Samuel Mudd, who were charged with conspiring to murder Lincoln and Edmund Spangler. All charged with conspiring to murder Lincoln and Johnson let them go. He pardoned them. There's Grant, which is a shame because there's uh, pardon, commuted, or rescinded the convictions of 13 and 32 people. And, most, and there are ex-Confederate leaders. All but 500 former top Confederate leaders were pardoned when President Grant signed the Amnesty Act of 1872. Now that brings to mind something else, which is something that this book also had another suggestion that I thought about doing as well. And that was They have this storyboard suggestion, but they don't have it here, right here, where they had a list of, maybe it was at the end of chapter four, which we haven't gotten to yet. It was, okay. So, the Amnesty Act of 1872 is not on here, but I think that that's so important. What they had here was another suggestion, which is, um, draw an illustration or uh, describe an ideal citizen, consider, and then work with a partner to research one of the following sets of laws or legal decisions. Record how each either restricted or expanded who could be a U.S. citizen or resident. And so, here we go, sorry about that. And so here we go with the list of all of these laws that were put in place that actually inspired or promoted or motivated white supremacist ideas and slavery. The Nationality Act, the Alien and Sedition Act, Dred Scott versus Sanford Act, Chinese Exclusion Act, Elk versus Wilkins Act, X Patriation Act, Immigration Act. That one was in 1924. So all of these were before 1924. And so I was looking to see if that one was also, if, if this one here was also included, the Amnesty Act of 1872. Because that to me seems to actually really promote also, well, at least the concepts surrounding slavery for sure. All right, so what else do we have here? And then what I did was I really didn't want to spend too much time looking this over because I, I, I was, you know, supposed to be focusing on interesting information about the three of them. So there's Ronald Reagan and there is a list. So among them, 406 people and among them, They've got FBI officials convicted in 1980 of authorizing illegal break-ins and fined. Mark Felt, later in life, admitted to being deep throat. Oh, the informant during Watergate. Marvin Mandel, former governor of Maryland, convicted of mail fraud and racketeering. Junior Johnson, a former NASCAR driver convicted of moonshining in 1956, pardoned in 1986. 
George Steinbrenner, convicted of illegal Nixon campaign contribution and obstruction of justice in 1974, pardoned in January 19. He was one of the only ones, I think, convicted in the, in the um, Watergate. We weren't looking up Bill Clinton or George W. Bush. We went to, or George Bush. I went to and saw a list of the people granted executive clemency by Barack Obama. But I did that very briefly after I was looking up the list uh, by Donald Trump. So Hmm. All right, so this is interesting, right? So the executive use of clemency, and there is the list. So, I, so for me, so uh, total of one hundred forty-three pardons during his four-year. I don't think that's what it said in the beginning. So. Chin down. So. After, you know, getting them my instructions, I went and filled in this data, but I also wanted to know about vetoes as well. So here, I started looking up the number of pardons, and then I wanted to look at the details of the pardons. So what party are they? Reagan was a Republican, 406 pardons. Obama, Democrat, 1927 pardons. Trump, a Republican, 237 pardons. So what's interesting to me is this is clearly not the full list of pardons since the, there's a, a 143 pardons here. So there's quite a discrepancy, a hundred, a difference of a hundred. So I don't know if a Farovich is on there, but you can see here then Scooter Libby. Previously, an age of the former vice president, Dick Cheney, convicted in connection with the CIA leak scandal, pardoned following an earlier commutation by President George W. Bush in 2007. Perjury, obstruction of justice, and false statements. 30 months in prison, two years of probation, and a $250,000 fine. I always like to know how much of the money do they actually end up paying, because you know you and I would have to pay every stinking dime. Oops. Something I wanted to do. This is Dinesh D'Souza. He's he's good. Like he's a character. I'm pretty sure he is. I'm not 100 percent positive, but he might be associated with this Discovery Institute. He's a wacko, uh, religious nut. Not, but he's like he's like a fake if you ask me. But, well, you know. So there's the convictions of that, all right, of him, uh, or, or the, the, um, the pardons from Trump. Most individuals who had executive clemency by Obama had been convicted on drug charges and had received lengthy and sometimes mandatory sentences at the height of the war on drugs. All right. So, so that tells me a lot. Did they tell me what most of, um, Trump's were? Cause that was interesting to me. Let's see here.
ordinary all requests for executive clemency for the federal offenses are directed to the office of the pardon attorney in the U.S. Department of Justice for review. However, Trump frequently bypassed the OPA and the majority of his executive clemency grants were made to well-connected convicts who did not file a petition with the OPA or meet the OPA's requirements. Overall, Trump granted less clemency than many of the modern presidents. Of the po pardons and commutations that Trump did grant, the vast majority were to persons to whom Trump had a personal or political connection or persons for whom executive clemency served a political goal. A significant number had been convicted of fraud or public corruption. That's what it looked like to me, but I didn't read this. So this is good. The New York Times reported that during the closing days of the Trump presidency, individuals with access to the administration, such as former administration officials, were soliciting fees to lobby for presidential pardons. They were also soliciting for, um, the Senate was, was actually soliciting for seats in the Senate. I remember that. When Barack Obama's Senate seat was vacated, they were literally taking money, lots, rolling dice, collecting gambling money for that seat. And that person was pardoned, the main person. The follow-up was not, from what, from what I remember reading. So here's the thing about all this. And then the vetoes. Well, let's get to the vetoes really quickly. And then there's also all the cartoons. We just read today about the riot in New Orleans where the police went in and just decimated 51 black men who were, who were protesting but hid, walked into the building, and shot them all dead. And then one white guy who was, who was an abolitionist. After a woman basically shouted, shoot him. He's one of those Yankees. Police, you have loyalties, but it's not with your oath. Too much history has shown us that. It's the massacre of New Orleans. Oh my gosh, it just makes makes you sick. It makes me sick. Yeah, I think that that's basically it, except for the vetoes and overrides, which was another suggestion, and that's actually what I was just looking at to show you. So, the vetoes, pardons, pocket vetoes, and veto overrides. So, I decided to go and look a little bit further, not by my own ideas or anything, but once again, what they had suggested in the book, in the, you know, Inquire and Inspire book or Inquire and Investigate. So here it's looking at the number of vetoes and veto overrides for the presidents from 1920 to 2020 to see if there were patterns in the data. So this is really great uh, information easy to get information and I'll show you why it's why I say that I think this is the one no oh, here I'm not even
There we go. That's what I was looking for. Oh my gosh, I thought I had it. I hate when I do that. I don't mind you guys searching with me, but I don't like it when I forget to, like, have you not look at me while I'm doing it. Okay, and then here we've got, starting with Biden, the number of vetoes, the number of pocket vetoes, and then the total number, and then the numbers of vetoes that have been overridden. So Biden's had eight vetoes, no pocket vetoes, none of his vetoes have been overridden. You override a veto with two thirds of the vote. So what ends up happening, and we talk about this in the bookless classroom is, is that a bill goes to be made law. So it goes through the house, they write the bill, they rewrite the bill in the Senate, they, they pass it in the house, they rewrite whatever they wanna do with, in the Senate, and then that bill, as it is, goes to the, probably gets signed by the Senate and the, and the house, it goes to the president, and waits for his signature to become law. That's how a bill becomes law. If the president has got all the, 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 the Congress behind this bill that it reaches his desk, he can still say, I don't want this bill. I'm the president. I don't have to have it. That's a veto. So that's veto power to get rid of a bill. bill. A pocket veto is, is to not sign a bill, but not veto the bill and let it basically die, for example, while they are out of session. While Congress is out of session, they come back, oh, I don't even know what happened to that bill. I don't know how that exactly works, but apparently if it's given enough time, it just dissolves, and, and then you have to hope it can get through Congress again, the House and the Senate again. For the, um, what was the other one? For the veto overrides, that is if I get two thirds of, so we can get we can get a, a bill to the president to sign if I have one if I have the majority fifty percent of the of the people sign the bill, okay, cool, goes to the president, but the president could veto it, but the president cannot veto it, or the veto gets it can he can veto it, but it gets overridden. If there are two thirds, 62%, instead of 50%, 62% of Congress signs the bill, then the bill is overridden. All right. So there we can see here for Biden. And actually, what I want to show you instead is just the ones that I was doing the research on, right? That we can see there. So for the three, we've got. Reagan vetoed 39 bills, Obama vetoed 12 bills, Trump vetoed 10 bills. So the thing to look at is who was in power at the time of the vetoes, right? If your Congress is in power, they're probably not introducing a bill that you're going to veto. But if your Congress is not in power, if your party's not in power in Congress, then maybe they're introducing a lot of bills that might get vetoed. Although I thought President Reagan had all had had both uh, House and Senate and the presidency. Number of pocket vetoes, 15 for Reagan. He just let things sit there and dissolve. Zero for Obama, zero for Trump. And each one of them had one veto that was overridden. So one interesting, another interesting detail that you would look into would be which one of those were so powerful of a bill that they got voted on by and approved and passed by two thirds of Congress. And if that was the case, why did the president himself want to veto that bill? Right? So these are ways that when I first started this, um, the power of the pardon, right? Pardon me, the power of the pardon. When I first started looking at that, I, um, it said, develop a list of questions about how and when presidents use their power. Well, how do they use it? When can they use it? And, and, and who'd they pardon? I didn't have any more questions. But as I went through here, I started to see other interests in vetoes and in who they pardoned and the classification in general, who you would say. So, all right, nonviolent drug offenders, Obama, 2000. Wow. Bidens don't include the 1900 of nonviolent, so that's not even part of his number anymore. It looks like it's part of Obama's number, though. So all those kinds of things 
that you discover. And even though I haven't come down on uh, exact answers for everything that I have here, if I wanted to, I could. I've got a great start, right? So if I wanted to, I could come down on exact answers for everything that I have here. And then, as it suggested, start graphing these things. You know, you could base it on political party, based on numbers, whatever. Start graphing these things. You could graph it based on who, who had the Senate, the House, the executive office, as far as political party. Although, I'm not sure what that's going to tell you, other than we're bar bipartisan and that we, you know, have political parties that are pulling us in a lot of different ways. But... It does give me a really good idea of where the power is and if the power is in the hands of the people or if the power is in the hands of the president. And it does seem to me that even though there's a lot of behind the scene things that go on that we don't know about, if a bill isn't going to get signed by the president, Congress doesn't take all the time to put, and money and efforts to put it into action if he's never going to sign it. And that's not a democracy that's working in our favor. So these are things that hopefully will inspire you and not discourage you to the extent that you decide there's nothing you can do about it and you become hopeless. I'm not hopeless. I really do think that the things I do make a difference and that in the end, they're going to make a big difference because I'm on the right side of this. And you need to think about that when you're voting. Who's on the right side of it? Who's behaving in a way that shows integrity and that is how we end up elevating our our mental states you cannot be it's just it, it is the fact it just is you could be an atheist i don't give a shit what you are the fact of the matter is is that you cannot support criminals and expect that you're going to have a healthy mind body and spirit uh you know reading even in that wonder the brief wondrous life of oscar wow that gangster dude had it all and and yet he had to drink himself and he would find himself uh you know waking up from nightmares and crying and being alone and crying all right sounds like a great life when you have all that right you got everything you want except for freedom because your life is a life of crime this is dr annette farovich not mine but I know who you are. This is Dr. Nut Farage. Thank you so much for joining me here in our DIY do-it-yourself psychologist. What are you supposed to be doing to engage yourself? This feeds your body, your mind, and your soul. This what? This, this book? No, no. I'm interested in it. Maybe you're not, but maybe you are interested in something we said about the veto or the pocket veto or about Civil War or about Ulysses S. Grant or about Johnson, Andrew Johnson, or about the fact that Lincoln had Andrew Johnson as a VP. And let's find out how, how well they got along. Dr. Nefarich, I'm the teacher. Thank you so much for joining me here in the classroom. I'll be back in 15 for our reading room, The Brief Wondrous Life of Oscar. Wow. Thanks for joining me.